I wake up early enough through the week to find solemn peace in the day. Living at home with three kids will bring enough stress to cause early balding. So, waking up early for an hour or two apiece is almost a necessity. I have three kids, ages 6, 2 and 4 months, Sophia, Avery, and Baby Dean. So again, to have a peaceful day, it must have peace. We've recently made a big decision to move from my wife's new job as a business manager for some big Fortune 500 company. From small town Illinois to small town Rosia, Minnesota, a move that big could test most any family's nerves. My wife Amanda makes the majority of the income. That leaves me to only take on small jobs like selling items on the internet or just providing handyman services around town. Since the kids are so little and not able to go to school full time, I can only work something resembling part time or seasonal to make side money and to be at home with the kids. To avoid the ungodly amounts of daycare costs, the move was long and strenuous making potty stops for what seemed like every other exit. Amanda's a new employer paid for the entire move, which made things easier than what it could have been if we had to scrounge the little bit of money we had left after buying the new house. Her new company came with a huge raise, a 401k, a pension, and benefits fit for a king. This alone made the decision of starting a new life so far away from home much more convincing. To be honest, the whole thing made me a bit nervous. Never having lived out of Illinois just made me uneasy. I'm not gonna lie, it scared me a little to move away from everything I ever knew. Considering all the things her new company offered, it was hard to tell her and the benefits. No, I needed a change. The whole family needed it. With Amanda being gone most of the day and not getting home until late at night, our marriage had found some weak points. She was overwhelmed with work and assuring our financial standpoint. I was slowly growing distant and depressed. We always promised each other to never let our jobs supersede our normal lives. But with how times are, she had to break that promise. The kids know their mother, but they only know her as their mother. Someone who comes in late at night tired, but is happy to see everyone. She gives hugs and kisses, but all of this is shortly lived due to the bedtimes for the children and the time that she comes home. I have little time with her since she comes home just exhausted. With our new home and life, she had promised more time with the family and me. I know this was an indirect lie, but I smiled anyway hoping for it to be true. The day finally comes. We get completely moved in in no time, thanks to the company paying for the movers we only had to follow them to the house. The new home is absolutely beautiful. Four bedrooms, two baths, two stories. A full basement on 25 acres in the countryside. Our nearest neighbor is about three quarters of a mile up the road. It's truly our dream home. We all walk in after a day and a half drive of shitty gas station food and low quality motel rooms. All of us stop and stare as we open the front door to what feels like a mansion in Beverly Hills. My oldest Sophia belts out, Wow, it's like my dollhouse. The middle child Avery is only two years old and doesn't speak very often except for the occasional, Hey, or thank you. Leaving the new baby boy Dean, he's only four months and can barely stay awake through a diaper change, let alone a life changing experience like this. Wow, this place is simply perfect, even better than the pictures. Amanda announced, breaking the silence of awe and amazement. Jason, are you listening to me? She said, trying to get my attention. What a... just lost in the beauty of this place. Like wow, the pictures didn't do this place justice. I said, reassuring her, and this decision. The outside of the house is beautiful. But as soon as I walked onto the property, a feeling of dread and sorrow overwhelmed me. I couldn't tell Amanda what I actually felt since this is her desperate attempt at trying to keep the family happy. This is what we needed, I said as I leaned in to kiss her. 
Sophia and Avery make gross out faces and noises, mocking our kiss. Amanda and I look at each other and giggle at the children's faces. We walk through the house and view into the kids' room. Sophia's and Avery's rooms are on the second floor divided by the bathroom. Whereas mine and Amanda's and Dean's nursery is on the main floor. I walk through the house by myself and investigate the basement. The basement has an open area as soon as you walk down the stairs with a glass sliding door facing the backyard for easy access. In between the stairs and outside door is one normal sized door, leading to the furnace and water heater. And just to the left of that is a smaller door about 2x2, two two, with a small knob with an odd shaped keyhole, almost resembling an access to a crawl space. I tried to open the door, but it appears to be locked and none of the keys given to us by the realtor can fit into the keyhole. It appears to take an older type of key. I wouldn't be too worried about it, but that house just gave me the creeps. I didn't spend any extra time trying to figure out the lock. Instead, I headed back upstairs to finish exploring the rest of the house. I catch back up with Amanda and the kids. My smile as I walk into Sophia's new room and see Amanda and all the kids finish unpacking the last little bit of clothing and room decor. It's been a long time since something like this had happened where we were all enjoying our time together. My smile fades as I look to the window to see a distorted face of what looks like a diseased deer skull glaring back at me. What? What the heck? I yell out as I go to grab the kids to pull them away from the window. Amanda looks at me and freaks out due to my reaction. What are you doing? She asked, confused about what was happening. There's a face in the window and... By this time, the face that I had seen disappeared from the window, as Amanda peers over to look. There's no face in the window, Jason. Amanda calls out. I think you need some rest. The drive must have taken its toll on you. She suggested trying to calm me down. Yeah, maybe you're right. Agreeing that seeing a face on the second story window is absolutely asinine, but I know what I saw. I really wanted to believe that I didn't see anything in that window, that maybe she was right and that I was just overly tired in imagining things. The face was just too real. The image is burned into my mind. I try to lie down for a nap and try to sleep, hoping that I would realize I was wrong but that thing's face kept me awake. Unable to sleep and to not think about it, I began to check the internet for some sort of reason or explanation as to what it was. Maybe hauntings in the area, I asked myself for a confirmation. Sitting here trying to make myself somehow believe that a ghost haunting my house isn't that bad. I find truly little evidence supporting the idea for ghost hauntings in the area surrounding me. Just some old people claiming their brother or aunt was haunting their house and moving their throw pillows. What I do find after some more detailed searches regarding diseased deer skull thing is odd to me. Wendigos. Being from Illinois, I've never heard of anything like that. I began to research what it is due to the astronomical amount of eyewitness reports uploaded to the town's page online, which had a specific subsection exclusively for these types of odd animal accounts. One reads that she saw had this wendigo following her from a rural highway all the way to her house which she said, I never meant to make eye contact with him, I really didn't. I had my nanak told him at home, and as soon as I got there, I ran inside to grab it. When I ran back outside with it to scare him off, he was already gone. I searched for a nanak to figure out what it was, and found out that it's a totem for the bear spirit which is said to scare off wendigos. I searched deeper into the lore of these creatures only to set myself into a deeper panic. The most common and basic lore I could find of this ancient creature dates to the Algonquin tribe. They call a creature that was once a man ripped apart from every grip of humanity by becoming a cannibal, eating human flesh causing them to become this terrifying creature with an insatiable appetite for anything living. They primarily hunt at night, but during the day, they mimic a human voice, 
to lure in and terrorize their prey mentally. They often appear as humanoid, bipedal creatures with a deer skull covering their face that look almost emaciated and diseased. With that sentence, my jaw dropped to the floor. The face. I mutter to myself in complete fear. Amanda walks through the bedroom door. Hey babe, are you feeling any better? I close my laptop quickly and turn in her direction. I fake a smile and say, Yeah, you were right. I think I was just overwhelmed by the whole situation. Well, okay then, not to be pushy, but are you making dinner or are we ordering out? She asked cautiously. Uh, yeah, I'll get something going here in a minute, honey. I reply using an almost obvious fake sense of happiness. She then proceeded to smile as she exited the room to go tend to the kids. I reopened my laptop to continue reading. They primarily eat human flesh, which is what causes the disease mocking and almost torturing their foreseeable meal. They get a kick out of teasing and scaring people. They are more than patient with their meals. They look deeper, trying to figure out how to stop or potentially kill these creatures. It says silver stakes through the heart or decapitation, but burning the body alive is the best method. Yep, that'll do it. I jokingly tell myself, try not to believe that I'm literally going insane. After doing my research, I needed something to distract myself from what I saw earlier, so I jumped up to go make dinner. Hey, who's ready for some dinner? I asked my patiently awaiting family. I made a simple and quick meal that I knew everybody would love. Tacos. I mean, who doesn't enjoy tacos? The entire family digs in stuffing their brains like they've never tasted real food. Except for Dean, of course, who is still eating from a bottle of formula. Dean and I watch the hurricane of small hands fly across the table and quickly devour all the condiments and additives for the meal. After the blinding fists of small children and Amanda stop, they all sit slump in their chairs content that their stomachs are full. I suggest to Amanda to get the kids ready for a bath so they can get settled into their new rooms. She nods agreeing, moving slowly due to overeating. After her and the kids head upstairs, I start to cleaning up the kitchen. While doing the dishes, I can see out the window that sits above the kitchen sink. The evening view is more than breathtaking. Various colors of red, orange, and purples mixed together in a wonderful mash of scenery only added by the early sightings of the stars, as the sun is just about to fall from the sky. I had never realized a sunset could hold so much emotion. In Illinois, these sunsets are beautiful, but they are nothing compared to here as the barely sunlit sky caresses the valley of trees beyond the house. For a moment, I find true peace and happiness. That is until I see it again. A distorted figure barely illuminated by the sunset, tall, gangly, and unpleasant. The creature stares back at me, unmoving like a statue. I too am frozen solid in this icy glare. I feel again that familiar overwhelming sense of dread overtake my body. It's watching me. I begin to shake in utter fear, dropping the dishes that I was holding, shattering them in the sink. The creature, still holding eye contact, slowly walks back into the dark woods behind it, assuring me that it is always watching. I turn around immediately to check on Dean who is sitting peacefully in a swing. A sigh of relief covers my body knowing that he is unaffected by the situation. Amanda walks in and asks, Is everything okay? She looks at me with genuine sincerity. Uh, yeah, honey, just slipped out of my hands is all. I awkwardly replied to her. Okay then, I'm off to bed. The older two are asleep and I was making sure everyone was fine here. Yeah, I was just about to put Dean to sleep after I cleaned up. She nodded and I smiled at her, knowing something was up. She could always tell when something was wrong with me. I never was good at hiding my emotions or lying. I was honestly scared that maybe I was going crazy or my family is being hunted by some old Native American folklore. 
Anyway, I distract myself from thinking about it by putting Dean to bed. Me and him religiously read a book while he drinks his bottle. It can be any book from his little kid's picture books to Charles Dickens. Either way, he knows after his bottle and book, it's time for bed. I lay Dean down in his crib and I slowly start my tiptoe walk out of his room. I softly turn on his nightlight and his baby monitor while making my escape back to my room. I close his door gently, not to wake him, and begin walking towards my room, which is just down and across the hallway. I enter my bedroom to see Amanda already sprawled out on the bed, mouth wide open and snoring profusely. I smile as I turn on our side of the monitor and squeeze into bed with her. She flops over and allows me more room to get myself comfortable. I quickly fall into an almost coma-like sleep within mere minutes of lying down, only to be fiercely awakened by the shrieks of Dean through his monitor. I jump out of bed and I sprint out of the room. I quickly open his bedroom door, only to find that Dean is still sleeping peacefully in his crib. Confused, I think to myself, I must have imagined it. I look at the time. It reads 3 a.m. Jeez, I say to myself, walking sluggishly back to my room now that the adrenaline had worn off. It sounded so real. I continued to think to myself, I'm probably still shaken up over all the Wendigo nonsense. I go to lay back down in bed with hopes of going back to sleep soon. 3.15 a.m. I am awoken again by the sounds of Dean's cries. This time, the cries were not coming from the monitor. That's when the panic sets in. It sounded like it was coming through the vents from the basement. Confused, I sit up rubbing my eyes, trying to focus on the sounds of my child crying. I pick up the baby monitor, trying to make sure that I'm not going insane. The monitor is still on. I pick it up and I bring it to my ear. I only hear the white static radiating from the speaker. I set it back down on my nightstand. I go to Dean's room to make sure that he's okay. He's laying there, bundled up in his swaddle, soundly sleeping. The echo of the baby crying, still reverberating through the air vents, validates that whatever is making this noise is not my child. What is going on with me? I asked myself unnervingly. Desperate to find where the wails of the random child are coming from, I hurried to the kitchen and grabbed the biggest knife. Unsure of what was going on, I wanted to be positive that I could be prepared for possibly the worst. I slowly opened the doors leading to the basement. The creak of the hinges let out a boisterous squeal, followed by the light from the kitchen casting down half of the dark staircase. I stand at the top of the stairs, staring down into the dark abyss as the cries of the child grow louder and louder. I begin attentively walking down the stairs, flicking on the light to give myself a sense of security and my surroundings. The cries continuously grow louder with each step further down what feels like walking into a concert. I reach the bottom of the steps and look around the corner, to be met with the darkness of the room. The moonlight glistens softly off the sliding door, and shines a small path of light into the room. I turn the basement room light on this time, hoping to find the source of the cries. The room is empty, but the atmosphere is filled with that high-pitched squealing. I anxiously hold my palms over my ears to try to reduce the noise which is now almost unbearable. I walk closer to the furnace room door, only to realize that the noise isn't coming from there but the small locked door. The same door that I wasn't able to open myself. Me, a grown man, not able to open this door, and yet a baby is now stuck in there. My mind and ears are on the verge of a meltdown if something doesn't start to make sense. I frantically try to open the door by pushing, kicking, and eventually screaming at the noise to just stop. Driving myself mad, I begin to drop to my knees, crying and pleading for the noise to just stop. Please stop. Just stop. I say as I weep and sob out of frustration, leaning my head against the door. I slowly begin to lose consciousness. 
Everything goes black and I lose all sense of despair. The screams have since stopped and my head no longer hurts. I feel strange. Maybe almost weightless like I'm swimming or drunk but I know I'm not either of those things. I suddenly wake up disoriented laying outside in the grass next to the tree line on the edge of my property. I jump from where I was laying, dazed and confused about the events that led me to where I am. Unsure of what is going on, I sprint back to the house to check on the kids and Amanda. Bursting through the door and flying into my bedroom, I can see that Amanda is still asleep in the same position I last saw her in. I release a visible sigh of relief as I continue to go and check on the rest of the kids. Every one of them is still sleeping in their beds. I go back downstairs to sit on the couch and try to piece together what is going on. I plummet into the cushion without looking back, sinking into the leather like a rock in water. I sit and I simply wait for my family to wake up. While waiting, I begin to nod off, still exhausted from everything. I await to my alarm on my phone going off. I check to see the time. 8.10 a.m. Curious, I say to myself. Everyone is usually up at this time. Completely ignoring the events of this morning, I start cooking breakfast in hopes that these smells coming from the kitchen might wake them up. The time is 9 a.m. and still no one is downstairs. The food is now cold and my patients are at an end. I now go to my oldest daughter's room to see if she is awake. I softly shake her side telling her, Good morning, honey. I got breakfast ready. And she finally wakes up. Sitting up and rubbing her eyes, she tiredly asks me, Daddy, why did you wake me up? I was trying to save mommy. Staring at her with a confused look at my face, I ask her, What do you mean? Save mommy? Mommy was running around trying to help baby Dean because he wouldn't stop crying. And then a mean monster man was telling her to follow him to the basement. What monster man are you talking about? The monster in the woods. He says that he protects the woods. I say nothing in return to what Sophia just told me. I run downstairs to my bedroom, trying to ask Amanda what's going on. Only to find that Amanda isn't in our bed anymore. I try to call her cell phone in hopes that she maybe just went outside for some fresh air while I was napping on the couch. When her phone goes straight to her voicemail, my heart drops. I begin looking throughout the whole house for her. The bathrooms, living room, kitchen, all the kids' rooms. I even ran out to the area that I had woken up in this morning. I searched the entire property, everywhere except for the locked door in the basement. No, I plead with myself. I couldn't even get into that room. Hysteria has overwhelmed me at this point. I go through so many possibilities of what happened to her. Maybe she just went to work early. I begin to say out loud. She couldn't have. She doesn't start a new job till the end of this week, and it's only Monday. My mind now racing with the worst possible scenarios, all somehow leading me to the locked door. My heart breaks as I give in to the urge to check the basement. I walk into the kitchen to see that Sophia and Avery are both up now. It is now 9.37am. Sophia, trying to be a good big sister, had grabbed plates and silverware from the boxes and crudely made both her and her sister plates of the now very cold food. I made our breakfast plates, Daddy, Sophia said with excitement. I'm trying to calm myself down before getting the courage to go into the basement. So, I asked Sophia and Avery if they had seen Mommy yet this morning. Nope, Sophia says. I already told you that she went with the monster man in the woods that I was dreaming about. Well, where did they go? I asked her to try to get the full story. The basement. The monster man said that he needed Mommy. Okay then. I replied in a defeated tone. How about you, Avery, and Dean go stay at Aunt Rachel's house for a few days so I can um, help your mom and the monster man? Sophia burst into cheers. 
Yay, Aunt Rachel. Kids are almost too easy to distract. No wonder whatever this thing was was able to deter Sophia. I make the phone call to Amanda's sister, Rachel. She lives about an hour or so south of her new home. When she answers the phone, I give her some big lie about wanting to have a few nights alone with Amanda. She accepts to take the kids for a few days and arrives a few hours later. When she pulls up, I already have all the kids' stuff packed and ready to go. She rolls down the window and asks, What's Amanda doing? I need to ask her a question. I nervously spot it out. Oh, she's currently in a meeting for work and won't be off for a while. Rachel buys the lie accepting that her little sister is always too busy for family. Okay, well, tell her to give me a call when she can. Rachel asks me. I will, no problem. I say as I'm loading the kids in her car. Rachel calls out. Okay, we'll see you guys Friday probably around to noon or so. Okay, I love you guys. I'll see you then. I holler in response as she's pulling out of the driveway. Okay, Jason. It's time to check that door out. I think a lot of my head at trying to psych myself up. Walking back into the house, I cautiously approach these stairs to the basement again. The lights are already on. Probably from when I turned them on last night. I creep down the stairs, trying to avoid making any loud sounds, and slowly turn the corner in the basement to look at the door. As I look around the corner, my jaw hits the ground. It, it's open. I say stuttering aloud in shock and terror. I keep my distance walking to the opposite side of the room from the door, hoping to glimpse at what is inside. Carefully edging along the wall like some old-time bank robber walking the edge of a building, never taking my eyes off of the now open door. The entire door frame is now directly in front of me as I stare into it. All I see is a dark void. In the bottom left corner, something catches my eye. It's a piece of fabric, the same as Amanda's pajama bottoms. She was here, I exclaimed. But how did she get past the doorway? I asked myself. I pull out my phone and turn my flashlight on to try to see deeper into the doorway. I walk closer and closer till I'm finally face to face with it. I can see the shred of pajama pants that was ripped from Amanda's pants. I turn my flashlight to peer further into the darkness, only to find nothing but dirt on the floor. I move to the right side and nothing but old cobwebs and pipes for the house sewer line. I flash it to my left to find her. Amanda was laying in the corner, her body ripped to shreds. I burst into tears as I started to weigh out the sight of my now dead wife. I jumped through the doorway to see if there was any chance that she might still be alive. I grabbed her hand, which is now lifeless and cold to the touch justifying my thoughts that she is gone. I sob over the top of her body until I hear it. It's Amanda's voice. I look further to the left from where the voice is coming from, to a tunnel leading out of the house. I can hear her voice call out, Honey, come here. In that very instant, it all hit me. Everything that I had researched was real. It really was a wendigo. It all lines up. The mysterious voices. My daughter seeing a monster man. Everything. And now this. Seeing my wife ripped to shreds and still hearing her voice calling out to me. I wasn't going insane. It was this thing. This monster. This wendigo. Now it has taken my wife. My one true best friend. Figuring it must have gone after her since I ignored its calls. Well, if it wants me, it can come get me. I rush out of the crawl space and get to my laptop. I look up a very simple question. How to kill a Wendigo? I instantly get thousands of results, most of which say burning them alive or decapitation is best. While others say a silver knife or stake through the heart will kill it instantly. Though that method is not definitive... My options are limited with the silver so I will have to resort to either burning or decapitation. I hurry to my shed to locate my charcoal starter fluid and long-nosed lighter for my grill. 
I have a small hatchet from way back when I was young, and thought that I was going to be some kind of adventurer. I put the hatchet in my belt loop just in case and kept my lighter fluid and lighter in hand as I go back downstairs into the locked door. With all my gear ready, I turn on my flashlight and begin my descent into the crawl space, walking towards my wife and her remains. I crouch down beside her and kiss her hand one last time to tell her how much I love her and how much she truly meant to me. I suddenly hear Amanda's voice again. Honey, come down here. I need help. It's still coming from the tunnel, just beyond Amanda's body. Knowing not to be deceived by the Wendigo's tactics of deception, I block out the thought that my wife is calling me to help her. I read they mimic sounds of humans to draw on their prey to their death. Thinking about it, I realized it almost worked on me for more than one occasion. I also read that the Wendigo is extremely fast and moves like a bullet, with an unrelenting force despite them looking so emaciated. Thinking of this monster seems almost like maybe I am going insane. I start to tune out these thoughts and focus on my surroundings. The tunnel that my fox wife's voice is coming from descends slowly and then eventually levels out. It's a short opening only about 5.5 feet tall by 3 feet wide. With myself being over 6 feet tall, I have to crouch to continue walking through. I walk slow with my flashlight out, illuminating the way in front of me. After what feels like walking for about 70 yards, the tunnel opens to a sort of natural cave. The smell upon entry is filled with the putrid scent of decaying flesh sitting outside in 100 degree heat. I cover my nose and I gag violently. While coughing and puking, I get teary-eyed from straining my already empty stomach. I hear my wife call out again in my fit of wheezing and gagging. Jason, help me. Over here, please come help. I gather myself up and follow the sound of the voice knowing that I'm getting closer to the monster. A loud thud happens just out of my flashlight's range. I flail the light back and forth, trying to see what made that sound. It happens again behind me, and then again to my left. This creature is playing with my mind. It's almost as if it thrives on the fear alone. My heart is racing now, trying to find where the creature is. I carry the lighter fluid under my left arm and the flashlight to my right hand. I attempt to reach my left hand over to grab my hatchet, hoping to maybe discourage the creature from attacking. The monster races to me and knocks the hatchet out of my hand, causing it to go flying a few feet away in the darkness as he also disappears. It feels as if the Wendigo is taunting me further, trying to make me hit my breaking point and allow his mind games to work. He is slowly tearing me down until I have nothing, and then I just give in to him. I keep turning around, trying to locate his exact position, but the darkness in the cave is too much for my little flashlight to illuminate, more than a few feet around the light. I start to yell out to him, trying to play his own game on him. Come on out! Show yourself! Show yourself, you coward! I yell random insults, hoping he would humor my pathetic attempt at fighting back. And to my surprise, it worked. Just not in my favor. The Wendigo slapped my phone from my hand, flinging the light sporadically in circles, landing what I can only assume is about 10 feet to my left. It had landed on its screen, exposing the light straight up, showing the ceiling. Just as I had hoped, he had showed himself. Walking over the top of my light, on the ground, a gargantuan of a humanoid, standing at least 8 feet tall and nearly scratching his head on the ceiling, came walking steadily in my direction. His body looked like he hadn't eaten in months. His hands were long and bony with elongated fingers and what seemed to be long claws. His legs were long and grotesque like his arms, and the most terrifying part of this entire creature was its face. His face was covered by some sort of old deer skull with the antlers still attached. And then, there were his eyes. His gaze alone would be able to cut through steel. He walked closer to me, still yelling out in my wife's voice. Come help me, Jason. Please, come save me. Followed by some sort of hideous laugh. 
He was messing with me. Frantically thinking of some sort of plan, I do the worst thing I could have done in this situation. I panicked. I ran towards the creature screaming some sort of piss poor attempt at a battle cry. But it all just came out like a trumpet being terribly played by an 8 year old. Thankfully, this did somehow distract the creature from continuing to walk towards me. I ran a straight line towards my phone with the flashlight still on. Miraculously, I get to it. But as I stand up in triumph with the phone illuminating my face, I suddenly realize that while well, yes, I drew on my phone, I've lost track of the gigantic monster that is now back to playing mind games. Didn't your mother ever tell you not to play with your food? I sarcastically call out to the beast as I'm swinging my light randomly hoping to catch up with him. His advances towards ending my light become critically more severe as he rips one of his claws down the center of my spine, cutting through my shirt and skin. Reeling in agonizing pain, I cry out, Oh, is that the best you got? I challenge the beast further. While searching aimlessly in the dark, I see the handle to my hatchet that the monster had smacked away previously. Desperate for any sort of chance of surviving this ordeal, I try to make my way in that direction, while making it look like I'm lost. Within a minute or two, I find myself standing above the hatchet when suddenly, another strike from the monster tears across my chest, slicing it about 8 inches long and exposing some of the meat underneath. Blood is now pouring from my body, making me feel lightheaded and nauseous. I kneel to grab the hatchet. My back and chest feel like they're on fire from the wounds. I grab the lighter fluid still tucked tightly under my left armpit and douse the blade of the hatchet with the flammable liquid. Lighting it on fire using my grow lighter, a big whoosh of fire erupts from the hatchet, now illuminating the room and my adversary. The flame is short-lived due to only the liquid being on fire, so I continuously spray small amounts of liquid to keep the flame alight. With every thrashing sound of the fire getting bigger, the Wendigo raises a hand above his face, trying to protect himself, as if he is in fear for his life for once. I see the fear fill his eyes as he is now only 10 feet or so in front of me, cowering away from the flames. I squeeze the liquid on the hatchet once more before I try to throw the hatchet at the Wendigo. I fling it as hard as I can towards him. The hatchet, now appearing to be a ring of spinning fire barreling towards him, hits the Wendigo directly in the back, causing the beast to completely freak out. It screams a horrid high-pitched scream, piercing my eardrums and rattling my insides. Hearing this noise alone made my stomach turn. I look at the Wendigo as it still stands before me with the hatchet still on fire stuck in its back. He slowly turns to me with the most terrifying scowl. Well, yes, I did hurt the beast, but I also pissed it off. Now he was done playing games and ready to finish the job. He lunges at me in what feels like pure hatred, tackling me to the ground and making me drop my phone again and squeezing a long stream of lighter fluid straight into the air and landing on its already lit back, causing the fire to burst out across the rest of his back and onto my face and left shoulder. We both scream out in agonizing pain as we try to rid the fire from our bodies. The entire left side of my cheek and top of my shoulder now suffer from third degree burns, while the Wendigo's entire back is now engulfed in flames. Unable to properly reach the burning hatchet, the beast flops on his back trying to pry it out using the ground, but doing this only drives the hatchet deeper into his burning flash. I stand in the awe of the moment, forgetting momentarily that all of this is seriously happening right now. I quickly snap out of my daze and grab the canister for the lighter fuel, squeezing the remaining liquid all over the body of the Wendigo. The beast flails in gut-wrenching pain, filling the void of the cave with screams like those of the ones he has mimicked throughout the years, are being simultaneously released from his eternal horror. The body of the Wendigo stops moving and just lays in front of me lifeless and burning. I stand there and watch as he burns, wondering just how long he has. How long had he been like this? Was he really forced to be a cannibal, or did he choose this path? 
A part of me still believes that, deep down, he was still human. I stand and watch as the fire eats through the Wendigo's body, till the cave fills with the nauseating stench of a burning corpse. I look around the smoke-filled room to find a door as I run hastily to open it. I latch onto the knob and swing it open violently to release me from the smoke and smells. As I open the door, a rush of warmth and daylight to overwhelm me as the black plumes of smoke rise to the sky. I turn towards the door to reveal that I was merely 50 yards downhill of where I had woken up this morning. The Wendigo must have made me sleepwalk and tried to lure me and Amanda into the locked room. Perhaps he wasn't satisfied that he only got one and wanted both of us at the same time. I'll never truly know the answers to these questions, and I'm not too sure I want an exact answer. The fire department was called due to the Wendigo burning unknowingly, creating a huge black smoke cloud directly over my house. Shortly after they arrived and the body of the Wendigo and Amanda were found, the local sheriff came to ask me some questions. He was a stereotypical looking cop, with the short fade in aviator sunglasses and full brim hat. He walked up and introduced himself as Sheriff Hayes. He began asking me questions of what all happened, and so I told him. Starting from the bad feeling of walking into the house and these strange noises, not to mention the sudden disappearances of the people in the town. Hearing me explain the story, I had expected him to just blow me off and send me off to the loony bin, but he didn't. Instead, he held on to every word, writing down what I was telling him. I asked him, Do you believe me? Trying to see if I was going to go to jail or not. You'd be surprised what goes on around the world that isn't put on file, he retorted. I sat there astounded at his answer, wondering if this was just the tip of the iceberg for monsters. The sheriff then gives me the bad news. Well, no, you're not under arrest. I just need to make sure that none of this nonsense gets out. So, I'm going to need you to come with me, son. Uh, but what about my kids? And what's going to happen with Amanda? I began to frantically ask the sheriff. Don't worry, they'll be just fine. I have a special crew of my own on their way down here right now. Not knowing what to do or if I should even believe what this man is saying, I tell him, Okay, let's do whatever we have to do. Maybe it'll be easier if I just play along and follow his rules, so that's what I do. I get into his squad car, and we begin to our unknown destination. I look out the officer's window to see the paramedics put my wife in a gurney, with a white sheet covering her, with a red stain protruding through. I grow sad thinking about Amanda, and feel like it should have been me instead. This feeling would never stop. We drove out of town, only taking back roads which seemed suspicious to me. What happened next terrified me. Sheriff Hayes pulled over and opened my door and told me, Listen son, I can't let you know where we're actually going, so I'm gonna have to blindfold you. I stared at him in terror and disbelief. What do you mean, where are you taking me? I asked with a trembling voice. Ah, oh, hell boy, I'm not gonna kill ya. You. you just can't know where we're going till you talk with the old man. You're not in any trouble. If I was going to arrest you, I would have done it back at the site you left. Now put this on and keep your head down, he said sternly. I reluctantly put on my blindfold and listened to his commands. I realized that I was in no position to really call the shots. We continued driving for what felt like an eternity till the vehicle came to an abrupt stop. The wheels let out a loud screech as I hear the door open and before I can react, I feel the man with giant hands rip me out of the back seat and throw me on his shoulder. He walks as I hear a Sheriff Hayes call out, Hey, don't hurt him. The old man wants a word with him. The man carrying me lets out an acknowledging grunt to signify that he had heard the Sheriff. We continue while I'm still blindfolded and on this man's shoulder when I hear a loud metal door open and shut as I'm thrown down into a hard chair. Go ahead and remove your blindfold please, Jason, 
An elderly man's voice rings out to me. My listen and remove my blindfold. As I met with bright, LED lights shining directly into my face, blinded me momentarily. I squint and hold my hand in front of my eyes, blocking the bright light. Turn the lights down, Maurice. The old man spoke. A sturdy grunt follows the old man's orders. Within an instant, the lights dimmed, and I was able to make out a figure sitting in front of me. An old man, probably around his early 70s, wearing a genuinely nice suit and tie outfit like he was some kind of big wig at a company. Where am I? I ask, still adjusting my eyes. You're in what we like to call the safety. It's a place you'll come to know very well in due time, my boy. Regaining my senses, I can see and hear without issue. The old man had a very polite demeanor about him. Behind him, I noticed Sheriff Hayes and who can I assume is Maurice, an exceptionally large man that does not seem to speak, only grunts. I asked them all, Who are you guys? Sheriff, care to fill our new guest in? The old man chimed out. Well, son, let me put it to you simply. We do exactly what you did last night. Kill the monsters that are out of line. The sheriff declared in his usual stern tone. You mean that there's more than just Wendigos? I asked in a confused and concerned voice. There's more than meets the eye, old boy. What you did last night was nothing less than impressive. The old man said as he stood up to walk towards me. Taking on a Wendigo untrained and alone as a suicide attempt, but... Nonetheless, you came through with flying colors. He continued... We want you to join us. We can train you and turn you into a full-fledged member sooner than later. What about my kids and family? Would I ever see them again? I asked the old man, not sure what else to say. Don't you worry none, my dear Jason. You will maintain your position as a father. Don't worry about your financial stability either. We can pay you quite generously, in fact. Hearing all of this eases my thoughts. Why me, though? We've already told you, son. The sheriff yelled out. Come on now and accept so we can drink. I sit there and think of Amanda and what that thing did to her. I couldn't live with myself knowing that maybe I could save someone from experiencing what I had to. Just maybe I could prevent someone else's wife from ending up like Amanda. I contemplate my choices. Either stay and become one of these guys and help protect the world, or walk away and drink my sorrows away till my children are orphans. Trying to find clarity in the situation, I look up at the old man and I say two words. I'm in.